Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Summit. My name is Kelsey Stewart. I am the Chief Community Officer at Fab Cafe, and I'm joining you today from Tokyo, Japan. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first session of our four feedback session series for the Circular Summit hosted by Fab Cafe and Loft Work. This year, the Circular Awards for projects and ideas that design the circular economy received 204 entries from companies, organizations, startups, designers, and other organizations from 24 countries around the world. After a rigorous review by 19 judges, over 50 projects from around the world have been selected as the Circular Awards 2021 winners. We welcome three of those winners today to join us for the first panel of the Circular Summit. The aim of the Circular Summit today is to provide a forum and place of learning, including open feedback, questions, and discussion among internationally and professionally diverse game changers in the circular economy. Our first feedback session focuses on the topic of a multidisciplinary approach to the circular economy. Professionals well known in their own field, such as today's guests, judges, architecturally trained David Benjamin, and two star Michelin chef Richard Ekebis have been exploring more sustainable approaches and solutions from within their own professional context. For this session, we want to explore the possibility to look beyond our own professional practices in order to transform the conventional economic model to become circular, we shall challenge our conventional understandings of how we might source our materials or ingredients, how we might process such materials and how we might treat the excess that results from such a process. Our panel today will be held in four parts. First, we will hear an introduction from two of the 19 circular judges. Following this, we will hear a five minute pitch from several of the winners of the circular awards who will tell us about their award-winning work. After hearing from both the judges and the winners, we will have a 25 minute open feedback session where judges and winners can freely comment and discuss each other's work. The fourth and final session will be a guided crosstalk on the topic of today's session a multidisciplinary approach to the circular economy. This session will be moderated by Tim Wong, who is the Fab Cafe Taipei and Lockwork Taiwan co-founder. We also warmly welcome listeners on YouTube to engage on the YouTube chat. So who are the judges that are joining us today? Uh, first, we have David Benjamin. David Benjamin is the founding principal of the Living and Associate Professor at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Second, we have Richard Ekebis. Richard is the Culinary Director at the Landmark Mandarin Oriental um, Hotel in Hong Kong. And finally, joining us as judge and moderator today is Tim Wong, uh, Fab Cafe Taipei and Lawfork Taiwan co-founder. Great. And without further ado, I would like to warmly welcome David Benjamin to please join us on the screen. Hello, David, it's great to see you. Hi, Kelsey. Thank you so much. And thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, everyone at the Circular Awards uh, for inviting me to participate and for holding this uh, important event for my field, you know, architecture and design, but for all fields. And it's exciting to be speaking about um, circularity in the context of interdisciplinary uh, practice. Um, last week, I actually was in Glasgow at the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26. And I can say, you know, with great um, confidence that the kind of work that all of the um, people and uh, organizations and companies that entered this awards um, the kind of work that everyone is doing and the, that the, these awards and this framework is supporting is so important and relevant to the future of society, the future of our planet, and to the kind of climate commitments that um, nations and companies and um, activists and nonprofit organizations are making. Um, so I um, am going to uh, share some of the work 
um, that I have done that touches on circularity. First, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible team that I work with. All of our work is collaborative in, in my studio of living, and all of these people individually and collectively uh, literally bring it to life. Uh, so um, as, as Kelsey mentioned, I have a small firm, a uh, small architecture firm. We um, engage research and practice uh, simultaneously. Uh, recently, we've been working with uh, circular approaches in some traditionally commissioned buildings, such as the one shown here, the Embodied Computation Lab that we designed for Princeton University. Uh, this is uh, what we call an open source building, uh, deliberately designed to be changed over time by multiple authors, a little bit different than a, a typical building these days. Uh, designing for, for change over time and designing with the idea that an object like a building is passed on you know, between people and is not just a, a singular act of uh, authorship. Um, so this building in particular then also engaged circularity by using a repurposed material uh, for uh, the facade of the building. In other words, we took scaffolding boards from New York City construction that would otherwise end up in the landfill. And these scaffolding boards are two inch by 10 inch planks that are used in basically every construction site in New York City. They're typically used for about a year and then literally thrown in the landfill because some of the boards have warping or cracking. And it's easier to create that one year of use rule of thumb than to look a little bit closer. Um, so we took this uh, salvaged material and used it as one of the construction materials uh, for a new building, taking an old material and using it for a new building. Um, we also processed the material in a custom way, thinking about using variation and difference in a used material as a strength rather than a weakness. Um, so we kind of invented a custom way to use computation and fabrication to create this new building facade out of repurposed or in a way circular um, materials. And here you see it um, as the south facade of the building. So um, in this respect, the facade itself kind of registers a story of a material over time from resource extraction, you can see a kind of tree on the left, um, to initial use as scaffolding for New York City construction, to some processing through a computational analysis of unique features of each board, then to some selective fabrication we used a kind of custom sandblasting of the wood to reveal some of the unique features and eventually to reuse as a building facade so kind of the story of the material from left to right shown in this drawing oops um, but more fundamentally this allowed us to start thinking about and developing this new perspective on buildings on really all buildings as a temporary formulation of uh, materials, energy, and labor connected to other formulations before and after the life of the building. So our building is just one stop on the life of this material. And so the building in its current formulation shown here is a kind of living lab designed to support experiments on the architecture of the future by students and faculty at the university with cranes, uh, like moving gantry cranes and large hangar doors that transform the space and with environments that will change over time as equipment and research and knowledge continually evolve. So a building as a living system. Um, so a second project I'd like to show briefly is one that we um, again explored design uh, for change over time. But in this case, this is a building in another part of the world with a different use. Um, so this is uh, the NIS engine factory for Airbus, the large airplane manufacturer in Hamburg, Germany. And the project involves the design of a new factory building for Airbus. Um, it's located on the last unbuilt corner of the Airbus campus, which has a kind of difficult triangular shape shown in red there. And for this project, we um, combined some of our same ideas about circularity and materials and a building that's flexible to change over time. Um, but we combined that uh, with many other goals and aspirations 
for a functional and sustainable factory of the future. But more specifically, this project involved using a data-driven design approach, um, taking advantage of computation to manage a wide range of measurable goals for a good factory, including things like operational goals, financial goals, environmental goals, and even social goals. So here's a more detailed view of those goals. Um, each one is kind of outlined with an equation for how we're calculating that. And with one of the goals specifically measuring a kind of, we could say the circularity of the building. We call this future expansion. Um, and in essence, we figured out a way to measure whether one design layout and option was better or worse than another one at being able to expand in the future, to be able to change and be reused according to conditions that we can't yet imagine. So how do you design for the uncertainty that will inevitably come and design a, a building, a fixed object to be changeable and to adapt and to be reused and to be circular? Um, so in essence, we were trying to see if we could model change over time in the computer. And again, similar to the previous building, we had this idea that many of the components were swappable and transformable in a kind of plug and play system. Um, digging in a little more specifically, here's the way that we calculated the production efficiency of the factory, measuring the flow of materials and people between logistics spaces in green, assembly spaces in blue, and paint spaces in red. And then here is the way that we took our design system and explored the design space um, of many different options for both a larger triangular building and also a smaller rectangular building to fit on the site. Um, we think this process uses the best of human creativity and intuition, as well as the best of data processing and number crunching. And it fits well with other aspects of um, more typical design, like schematic design representation of the layout of a building. And it also engages some advanced digital simulation, such as this study of the natural ventilation in the building. In other words, this is a building that has no air conditioning um, for environmental reasons, but we still want there to be a good flow of air. And we wanna be able to keep the workers cool. Um, this process involved a, a long, uh, a large amount of kind of data processing and algorithms that would help us explore different designs and manage the way to achieve, um, you know, the best circularity score, um, but also the best score for the flow of paint and uh, assembly and logistics, um, as well as um, uh, trying to achieve the best score for things like employee work conditions and other um, social aspects of the building. So we're managing all that complexity um, through a version of artificial intelligence. Uh, but in the end, the goal was to create a usable, functional, enjoyable space, a kind of factory um, that had some of the qualities, the architectural qualities of a cultural space um, with materials and light um, and green space and views out of the building. Um, so in the end, we think this is a factory that balances a uh, human environment, production and uh, function basically, as well as cost. So that kind of shows how um, circularity can be um, part of a project, um, but a bigger design ecosystem of a project, not the only design idea of a project. And finally, for our discussion about how circularity can change the way we think about many things, um, I'd like to show uh, one last project, and this is an experiment um, that we did uh, with uh, a certain definition of circular materials. And this project started, as many circular projects do, um, with a, a, a kind of uh, circular diagram. In this case, we were kind of abstracting and simplifying the Earth's natural carbon cycle, the endless uh, loop of growth and decay and regrowth. 
And the hypothesis of the project was that maybe we could um, borrow from the carbon cycle and then return back to the carbon cycle um, without negative consequences, um, but nevertheless make a useful building. In other words, maybe we could start with low value raw materials, start with waste instead of something like plants uh, or uh, raw materials in the earth. So start with the low value raw materials, spend a very small amount of energy converting those raw materials into building blocks, uh, make a useful structure, and then at the end of the useful life of that structure, return all of that physical stuff of the building, all of that matter back to the carbon cycle, rather than having all of that matter sit in a landfill for a hundred or a thousand years. And the way we set out to um, experiment with this hypothesis was through a living organism called mycelium. And you can see mycelium here in this microscope video, and it's this uh, branching root-like structure of mushrooms. And it creates these incredible patterns. You can see these nutrients coursing through these thin white filaments. Uh, and it, it creates um, this, this uh, kind of signature look, but we were interested not so much in the form of mycelium function, of mycelium because it turns out that you can take mycelium, combine it with agricultural waste. So not the high value part of agriculture like corn kernels, but the low value part of agriculture like chopped up corn stover, combine those two things together, agricultural waste plus mycelium. And in just about five days, shown sped up in this video, it forms a solid object. And uh, the idea is that this object, which is grown uh, from waste materials rather than extracted, using extracted materials from the earth and rather than um, using the heat, beat and treat methods of typical materials, this process of a grown material might be able to create um, an architectural material such as a load bearing uh, architectural brick. And since nobody had created large scale uh, outdoor architecture out of this material before, we had to do a huge amount of testing. Here we're um, compressing one brick with 10,000 uh, pounds. Um, here we're uh, compressing a small assembly of bricks. So we're doing a lot of testing to see if it would be viable to use this new type of material, this we could call it circular material to create viable architecture. Um, and the, uh, the kind of target of this project uh, was to create a uh, temporary structure in the courtyard of the Museum of Modern Arts, MoMA PS1 in New York City. And um, here we are with uh, assembling the structure in about three weeks and adding to our kind of material ecosystem and our kind of technology ecosystem, a kind of... Um, layer of creativity and expertise because we have um, graduate students from Columbia University who know a lot about um, architecture and form and computation working side by side with brick masons who know a lot about stacking objects. Neither of them had created something with this new material before, but they kind of um, combined their knowledge and problem solving together. And I should note at this point that all the people that worked on this project were fairly paid um, there was no volunteer labor and in essence combining a kind of uh, layer of, um, of, of, uh, of kind of labor and fair society treatment to our experiments with architectural materials. Um, here is the constructed structure. Um, you can see it in the context of the more typical glass and steel buildings of Manhattan in the background and the uh, typical uh, red clay brick uh, building of MoMA PS1 uh, closer in the foreground. And this was a kind of medium scale test of this idea of uh, a new grown material, a material from agricultural waste. And I say medium scale because it was more than just one story of a building, it was about 40 feet tall, and more than just a few different bricks. Uh, you know, on a lab bench, it was uh, 10,000 bricks. So we were testing the scaling up of this material. 
Um, and here you can see what it was like to kind of walk inside um, the structure. And this was important for us because we wanted to test this new circular material beyond just its technical performance, but also we wanted to, to experiment with its, I mean, we could call it like uh, atmospheric performance or its uh, creative performance. What would be the qualities of light and shadow, texture, foreground to background? Uh, what would it feel like and smell like uh, to be inside a structure made of this new material? Um, but of course, the ultimate test of any project installed at MoMA PS1 in the summer, and this is part of a, uh, a long history of competitions where um, young architecture firms are selected to design um, a summer pavilion for MoMA PS1. So for any of these projects, the ultimate test is uh, its ability to host a good party because every Saturday of the summer, uh, 5,000 people come to the courtyard to hear experimental electronic music. And this was the first Saturday of our installation. And we were thrilled, um, but also terrified as people were climbing in our structure, walking inside it, scratching it, um, and basically occupying it. Um, but of course, this was entirely fitting and satisfying for us because our idea is to take architectural experiments and test them out in society, out in culture, out in the public, um, rather than um, just on a lab bench or in the fenced off corner of a construction site, um, but actually put these experiments out in the world. Um, and of course, there was a kind of um, public reaction, people who may not have known much about this material or, or, or about circularity um, or even about architecture kind of interacting with the structure and commenting on it and engaging it. Um, and I will just close by saying that um, unlike typical architecture, we took great care at the end of life of this pavilion. Um, in other words, we took the structure and um, disassembled the bricks, um, crumbled them into smaller pieces, basically broke them up um, physically, combined them with yet other organisms in terms of worms and bacteria in a composting site. And after about uh, 60 days, all of the physical matter of the building, all of those bricks returned to compost, uh, returned to basically soil through composting. Um, and then in our uh, kind of engagement of this circular life cycle, we took that soil and gave it to New York City for tree planting and also for community gardens, in essence, um, showing that this is a non-toxic enough material to eat. Um, more broadly, because we do a series of experiments where we're trying to um, look at some specific new materials or new ideas or new technologies, but also trying to see could this uh, be a broader idea for us? And our broader idea for, for ourselves and potentially for other architects and designers who are interested is that maybe we can spend as much time designing to disappear as we typically spend designing to appear. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your incredibly inspiring presentation. I deeply appreciate the time and effort you put into that. I, I truly enjoyed uh, witnessing both of the projects that you were explaining about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So next, I would like to warmly welcome Richard Ekebis, Culinary Director at the Landmark Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Hong Kong, to join us on the screen. Hi, Richard. Thank you. Hi, Kelsey. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Hmm. Let me begin your presentation when you're ready. Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, David, for a very inspirational presentation. Mine is a little bit shorter. Um, uh, just wanted to introduce myself. So uh, my name is Richard Ekebus. I am the Director of Culinary Operation uh, and Food and Beverage of the Landmark Mandarin Oriental. Um, I'm also the consulting chef for 58 Degrees Grill in the Mandarin Oriental Pudong in Shanghai. Um, we have been holding um, in Amber Restaurant um, um, two Michelin stars since uh, 2008. Um, we have been voted uh, two years ago Asia's 50 best uh, most sustainable restaurants. And uh, Amber is a, a, a regular uh, in the world's 50 best restaurants since 2010. 
So uh, Amber Restaurant, that is uh, the iconic restaurant of the landmark, uh, not the only restaurant we have in our building, of course, and, and I will go uh, further into this um, uh, as we go. Uh, but uh, we are part of a hotel called the Landmark Mandarin Oriental, which is part of the Mandarin Oriental uh, Hotel Group. Uh, it is the only hotel within the group that is uh, branded under a platinum label. Uh, as you might know, all Mandarin Orientals around the world are uh, branded in a, in a golden uh, fan. We have a platinum fan. And that makes us uh, somewhat uh, different, but also special, in my opinion, uh, within the group. We are... Uh, basically a hotel that uh, spearheads many initiatives and start up uh, many ideas and concepts that uh, have been uh, adapted eventually within Mandarin Oriental over, over the years as group policies uh, and particularly in the field of sustainability. Um, we are, uh, as we call it, an urban oasis located in central. Of course, uh, Hong Kong is a, an extremely urbanized city, but uh, we, we want to be seen as a hotel that is not only a hotel, but that it is really a, 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 a sort of a, ro a resort within within a city. We have 111 designed rooms um, and suites, which uh, includes uh, the entertainment suites, as you can see within this uh, in this picture. We have uh, a very large, uh, actually one of the largest spas uh, in Asia, urban spas in Asia, which is the award-winning Oriental Spa, um, which is basically. Um, an urban sanctuary for relaxation and wellness. Uh, it is not only spa treatments, but also wellness uh, that we that we um, uh, undertake in these uh, two floors. We have uh, six uh, incredible restaurants. Uh, of course, we have two Michelin star Amber, but we also have three Michelin star Sushi Shikon, which is an Edo style sushi restaurant by uh, Yoshitake from Tokyo, uh, where he also has uh, three Michelin stars. Um, we have a restaurant called Som, which is basically an abbreviation of sommelier, and it's a restaurant and bar led by sommeliers. We have Mobar, which is an all-day dining and uh, a bar where we have uh, many live music performances and daily DJ performances. We have PDT, which is uh, the only outpost of legendary bar in New York, uh, Please Don't Tell, um, and uh, a bar that was uh, constructed uh, completely of reclaimed materials. Uh, and we have Kapurin, which is basically the second restaurant by Yoshitake. It's the only concept uh, he has ever done besides his Edo style restaurants and um, is uh, a uh, restaurant which basically means uh, cook, um, uh, cut and cook, and, and it's a modern uh, Japanese restaurant. Um, our hotel is, uh, as mentioned, a driving force within uh, sustainability. That is not something that we have uh, um, um, a direction we moved into in the last years. It's an initiative that has grown over the last 16 years of our um, uh, existence. Um, our um, sustainable efforts are built under three um, pillars, uh, which we divide into a pillar of social, environment and sourcing. Uh, under these pillars, um, there are many initiatives that are spearheaded uh, throughout the hotel, throughout the spa, but also throughout our restaurants and bars. Um, within our restaurants, of course, sourcing uh, is an extremely important part. So what we're trying is to uh, be um, uh, not only um, promoting a very strong plant-based dining uh, uh, agenda, but also where we are very um, focused on uh, sustainable sourcing. So not only in terms of um, uh, uh, seafoods and, and, and proteins, but uh, also in terms of vegetables, of course. Um, we are uh, a driving force for the last 16 years in terms of sustainable seafoods. I am an active member of the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition, where we try to drive change in legislation. Um, we uh, have driven this for the Mandarin Oriental uh, group and has eventually been adapted as a global uh, policy within the group. Um, we are uh, very focused on ethical source protein. And what do we mean with ethical source protein is that, of course, we live in an era of uh, industrial farming. Uh, and with that comes uh, a lot of problems. Uh, and what we're trying to focus on is uh, proteins that have been um, uh, raised according to a very high standard 
um, uh, of farming, uh, meaning that, of course, the well-being of uh, animals uh, are uh, well taken care of. Uh, the, the, that the feeding that are used uh, within the proteins we serve that are uh, local, uh, that um, there is no usage of antibiotics and growth hormones, and that we basically promote um, uh, heritage, uh, 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 heritage uh, meats and poultry within our menus. Um, then a very important part of our operation have been over the past uh, uh, decade has been to eliminate uh, single-use plastique from our operations. Um, and we have been uh, very successful in doing so. We have worked with many manufacturers, manufacturers in developing uh, alternatives for, for packaging that are plant-based or plant fiber-based. Um, we have uh, successfully um, uh, implemented this and this policy was uh, implemented by Mandarin Oriental Hotel Group uh, two years ago. And proudly to say that as from March this year, all our hotels worldwide are single-use plastic free. Um, we have a zero waste management approach. That means that we are aiming not to, um, to manage our waste only very uh, in an effective manner, but particularly to try to avoid waste. Uh, so through clever uh, implementation, we work with um, uh, composting systems. We also work with uh, uh, bio uh, digesters to ensure that we cut down on waste. And uh, year on year, in the last two years, we have been able to reduce more than 50% of our uh, waste output as a hotel. Um, with that, we have worked with many uh, circular businesses, enable, enables us to recycle certain elements of our waste into uh, very useful um, elements, such as, for example, the scallops that we normally use in our restaurants normally would go to landfill. And now we have found a manufacturer that makes a little mother of pearl spoons out of uh, the scallops that we use for uh, our signature dish in amber. Um, so this is just uh, one of the few uh, examples, but others would be that uh, during the renovation of our seventh floor, where most of our restaurants are located, uh, we have uh, recycled 98% uh, of all materials used. And one of the most notable ones was in the old amber, we had a very large uh, designer feature by Adam Tiani uh, on the ceiling that was made out of bronze. And we created a competition for local artists to use the bronze and to recast the bronze in new artworks for the seventh floor. And um, that was... Um, uh, a, a big success of, of the project and, and a great enhancement of, of the incredible architecture by Adam Tihani, the, the New York designer. Uh, through the process, we support uh, small local businesses. Um, we have worked with an extensive large amount of local businesses, local farms, uh, to, um, uh, be, uh, to, to build this um, uh, community of circular businesses. Um, we, as a hotel, we are active uh, fundraisers, not only for local businesses, for local charity, charities, but also international charities. As you can see, the moustache I'm wearing today is not my vanity, but we are, uh, as a hotel, raising funds for November this month. Uh, and um, every month we have a very focused charity where we want to give back to society. Um, I am an active speaker on sustainability, uh, and also uh, my team members are uh, active speakers on sustainability. It's something um, that we feel is very important. Uh, with the changes uh, that we incurred uh, two years ago, we uh, have been uh, 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 very active uh, in this field, and, and uh, through that we have seen uh, significant changes uh, even in Hong Kong, uh, where we see other businesses picking up very similar initiatives in terms of, uh, initi of uh, in terms of sustainability. So uh, that is uh, my presentation, Kelsey. Uh, I'm excited to be uh, part of um, of this uh, circular um, uh, competition, and uh, and and excited to share some of my views and my found findings uh, on the submitted uh, dossiers. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation, Richard. I think what I what I really love about your presentation is that it really kind of um, nails the head about this question of, you know, what can we do as, and then insert your profession here, 
And I think it's incredibly inspiring that as a chef, you're not only conquering, you know, different challenges or, or issues in the kitchen, but, you know, looking around you and seeing how can you make the biggest impact within this, um, you know, large luxury hotel. I think that's incredibly inspiring. And I also didn't know that you were going month by month to, you know, go towards different charity uh, related initiatives. I think that's also very beautiful. Thank you so much thank for you. sharing. Pleasure. Great. So thank you very much again to both of the circular judges for giving your keynote speeches. Uh, from now, I would like to go ahead and take a five minute break. So anyone in the audience who is watching uh, from YouTube, if you're interested to reach out to us, to ask a question, to make a connection, to give us some feedback, just to let yourself known as somebody who's listening in the audience, please feel free to scan the QR code uh, right now in my screen and let us know that you're listening and let us know what you think. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And from now, we will be taking a five minute break. Following the five minute break, we will also have the uh, pitches from the three winners who are joining us today. So please stay tuned for that. Thank you.
everyone, and welcome back from the break. This is Kelsey Stewart at Fab Cafe Tokyo. In our next section, we would like to take some time to hear pitches from several of the selected winners of the Circular Awards. First is going to be Dr. Nori Awati Muliono, who is the co-founder and CEO of Biopack. Her winning work is entitled Biopack, seaweed-based biopackaging, sustainable, compostable, circular, and edible. Her work was selected by Richard Ekebis. Second, we will be hearing from Linda Ding, who is the co-founder of Eno. Her winning work is entitled Eno, Transformative Experiences to Return Back to Our Roots. Her work was selected by David Benjamin. Third, we will be hearing from Taishi Suzuki. Taishi is the manager of business development at Kaiho Industry Company Limited. His winning work is entitled Eco-Friendly and Profitable Auto Recycling System. His work was selected by David Benjamin. Now, without any further ado, I would now like to warmly welcome Dr. Nori to join us for her presentation on Biopack. Dr. Nori, are you with us? Yes, Kelsey, I'm here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, good morning, all of the senior uh, guests. Many thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> so, um, plastic has caused severe pollution problem and it enters uh, our food chain. So it's not only about uh, ISR problem, not only about the cleanliness, but also about health problem. Plastic cannot be excreted uh, normally and it remains in our body and it could be transferred to the baby through the placenta. Luckily, nature has provided us the solution in seaweed and Indonesia is the second largest seaweed producer in the world, through, so we only use less than one third of our seashore. So we use seaweed to manufacture seaweed-based uh, packaging that is fully sustainable, biodegradable, and compostable. We want to be the first true biopackaging manufacturer and the leader in the circular packaging story that can expand across packaging variant formats. We incorporate triple bottom line approach, people, planet, and profit in our business. So we deliver our products with competitiveness as shown uh, here. And with this value, we enable to grab the market, the demand from uh, various sectors, uh, such as food and beverage, then food industry also, then personal care, retailers, and even pet lovers. Here are the testimony from our customers about our product biodegradability. And now we also have a certified uh, two international certification body for rich registration to enter European market. And we embrace green economy, so we source the seaweed directly from the seaweed farmers. Then, uh, so we can empower coastal communities then we distribute our products worldwide. The environmental impact that we can uh, create is a reduction the CO2 and uh, plastic waste. And we also create social impact by improving the livelihood of coastal communities and urban society. We have patented our products and technology and we deliver our uh, products with good quality and uh, certification. We have a won, uh, we have won some awards and grants before and after company establishment. We know that uh, our mission will not succeed if we uh, stand alone. Therefore, we welcome for everyone to build mutual partnership here with us to save our planet from further destruction. We want to inherit clean and healthy Earth for the future generation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Nori. You've won quite a few awards. That's very impressive. Wow. <laughs> Actually, I'm very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was wonderful. And I really hope that one day I can touch and feel the packaging myself. Um, you know, with Fab Cafe, we have cafes around the world. And I think it would be very wonderful if we could also have the vision of using this kind of sustainably sourced and um, designed to disappear packaging. Thank you so much for your presentation. 
Yeah, some of our products, I have to pack this. Like uh, this one for hotel amenities, uh, this one for soap bar, this one for shampoo, this one for dentap. So we can really uh, provide plastic free toiletries uh, hotels. Then also we have collaborated with uh, local people to uh, build synergy. Wonderful. It's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. Great. The next person I would like to welcome to the stage is Linda Ding, who is the co-founder of Eno. Her winning work is entitled Eno, Transformative Experiences to Return Back to Our Roots. Um, so thank you everybody for your time today. My name is Linda Ding, and I am one of the co-founders of a project called Eno. Um, Eno is located in Kamikatsu, which is the first zero waste village in Japan. And the point of Eno is, is an educational program, and we call ourselves transformative tourism because we're inviting our guests to come live with us to not just experience zero waste on a surface level, but to actually integrate into the community to feel like they're a local, and more importantly, to learn lessons from the countryside that as a visitor, you will not be able to get. Um, and we want to be able to give people a chance to experience a new perspective, especially if from uh, most of our guests who are coming from cities, coming from a background where they've never actually experienced life in this way, we want to give them a chance and to see that they can learn a different way of living. And so Ino was started in Kamikatsu and Kamikatsu back in 2003 became the first village in Japan to de uh, declare for zero waste. And what that means in Kamikatsu is that there is no uh, garbage collection system. So there is no way of collecting your garbage individually. Instead, every resident is responsible for bringing their own waste um, to our central collection center. And at the Central Collection Center, all of the waste uh, each resident brings is separated into 45 different categories. And the benefit of this is that the idea behind Zero Waste and Kamikatsu was that they wanted to divert 100% of garbage away from landfills. And when you look at the national average in Japan, um, it is about 20% recycling and 80% of waste is incinerated. Whereas in Kamikatsu, it's almost the exact opposite. We have an 80% recycling rate and only 20% is incinerated or put into landfills. And because of this, um, this has garnered a lot of international attention, um, of course, also from Japan as well. But that means that there are a lot of visitors who want to come to Kamikatsu to learn about zero waste here. And in that sense, most visitors are only able to get a what we call a study tour so they'll go to the garbage center and just take photos of the different categories of separation. But the way that this actually has an impact on someone is to live in it yourself, to be able to experience what that means to treat waste in this way. Um, and as a personal experience of living in the village, by taking garbage and not directly throwing it away after you're done into the garbage can, and therefore your mind considers this material garbage, by actually cleaning and separating it into its proper categories, we can reconfigure the way that we think about what is waste in the first place. And so because this system is so important by having hands-on experience, we created Eno so that people can actually have a chance to experience this for themselves. And with Eno, we started with um, an introduction to zero waste as a way to bring people in. But more importantly, what we're trying to showcase is that beyond just the zero waste system, um, there is something more important, which is information and knowledge in the countryside in a past way of life that is almost all but forgotten. Um, since now we are living in this consumer society where the idea is that anything you need, we will go out and purchase it. Whereas in the past, circular meant that their economy existed in every single locality. And so when you needed something, you first learned how to do it yourself. And if you didn't do it yourself, you would have a neighbor or someone close by who would do it. So everything was kept local. And a lot of the self-sufficiency has been forgotten because we have, you know, the ubiquitous onset of shops and stores everywhere. 
And so part of what Eno is trying to do is there are still so many local, we call them um, teachers in Eno, who possess these skills because they've grown up with them and they continuously use them. And a lot of these people right now are quite old and without a new generation to take over these skills, they will be lost. And so we want to use Eno as a bridge in order to connect those who have these skills to the younger generation or just the generation who have grown up in cities away from this idea and to connect them so that we can reshape uh, the way that we think about what is circular, what we think about how we are capable of doing uh, things for ourselves, and also to maintain this knowledge that it's not lost. Uh, here you'll see in the very far right corner is rice. Uh, we call it inakari. And this way of drying rice means that you actually harvest the rice by hand. Um, and this scene you actually um, don't see very much anymore because now everybody is using machines. And so this scene of hand cutting rice and drying it, which by most farmers and also chefs will say that it produces a much tastier rice, you know, this is being lost. And so this is the kind of information we want to preserve. An example of a teacher um, that we introduced to our guests is Osamu Nakamura-san. And he actually lives a life that is fully sustainable. Um, he collects firewood so that he heats and uses energy through fire. He only has a uh, three light bulbs in his house. And so his only bills every month is about 400 yen, uh, so about $4. And everything he does for himself and collecting firewood, um, his water comes from the mountain, he creates his own garden for food, and he doesn't own a car, so he doesn't have to pay for gas. Whenever he needs to go somewhere, he uses public transportation and he walks. And so this is a kind of lifestyle, you know, that you may read about um, in magazines about how to be sustainable, but it's very hard to actually see someone living that. And so we want to give people a chance to see that this kind of lifestyle actually exists and is possible. And as um, a way of practicing what we preach. We're also, um, the three co-founders on the team, we're also trying to learn by doing as well. An example is awabancha tea, which is a very local tradition of kamikatsu, um, which is being lost because the farmers who are doing awabancha are now passing away and there are no new farmers coming in to take over. And so this year, um, we created our own awabancha from start to finish. First, we learned from the locals last year, and this year we created our own brand um, called Two Ladies, Awabancha. And we're using this tea as a way to also promote this tradition so that we're teaching people that we don't want to lose it, but also that two girls from the city can make this. And so we want to be an example that anybody can also do this too. And so the founders of Eno um, are myself and Kana Watando, who is also from Canada. So I myself am also from Canada. And our third co-founder, who uh, Turumi Azuma, is a local of Kamikatsu. And her mother, Hitomi Azuma, was actually the founder of the Zero Waste System in Kamikatsu. And so we also wanted to embody this way of using, you know, outside and inside. So having new ideas, mixing with the old and creating something new altogether. And essentially what we're trying to do is come back to this idea that circular used to mean doing things locally, doing things for yourself and doing things by hand. And so we want to use this program as a way to inspire people who are, you know, the people are the foundations of change. People are what these systems are made for and what um, who run these systems themselves. And so if we can change people's mindsets about what is circular, then we will start to see change in all different types of um, corners of the world. And Ino is actually a word in Awaben. Awaben is the local dialect in Kamikatsu, and it means let's go home. So we use the word Ino as a way to say, you know, your home is in Kamikatsu, and please come home to Kamikatsu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda, for your very beautiful presentation. Um, even before the Circular Awards, I had heard about the activities in Kamikatsu for Zero Waste and have always been uh, very impressed by the recycling systems that you have all developed there. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Great. So our third and final present today from the winners is going to be by Taishi Suzuki, the Manager of Business Development at Kaiho Industry Company Limited. He will be presenting on his project, uh, Eco-Friendly and Profitable Auto Recycling System. Taishi, are you with us now? Ah, oh, I see you. Thank you, Kelsey. 
Great. You may begin your presentation when you're ready. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you for thank you everyone for having me today. Um, let me share our project about eco-friendly and profitable old mobile recycling system. Um, let's get started with this picture which I took in the Africa and in India. So when you when you visit the developing countries, you could easily find this kind of situation. In the world, uh, 1.3 billion automobiles are running in the world, but in the end, these are going to be the end of life. But especially in the developing countries, uh, they don't have the proper recycling infrastructure so that the uh, end of life uh, vehicles, they contaminate the soil and water. And also uh, people don't know how to recycle properly so that uh, they are working in a dangerous working condition. So when I explain the importance of our business, recycling business, uh, we use a human body as an example. So to maintain your body health, um, first you, you eat foods and then nutrition needs to be the circulate through your uh, arteries, like a blood circulation. But after that, uh, waste needs to be the carry to the organs for processing uh, through your veins. Uh, it's like the same way in automobile industry also, uh, car makers will be the arteries and they create the new products and enrich our life. Uh, but like, like us, uh, the car dismantling company, a recycling company can be the uh, veins in, in the planet. So we collect the end of life vehicle and recycle them. So we can contribute to the preservation and conservation of the global environment. So both parties are indispensable for the closed loop value chain. So what we do as a business is the, we collect the end of life vehicle from the local and we segregate material, material wise like uh, iron, aluminum, copper, platinum, and palladium. And the end of life vehicle has the remaining the reusable parts. So we uh, take them out, then we export to the 90 countries as the second hand parts. Also, uh, we make the upcycle up cycle product uh, like this. And we do not only sell parts, but also we take responsibility for the recycling of automobile. So we have set up the training center uh, in 2007 to provide the knowledge of the Japanese recycling skill with the automobile private companies in the world. And also we provide lectures about recycling system and regulation in Japan with policy makers, especially for the developing countries uh, like this. Uh, this picture take, took uh, in the Malaysia. And our strength is that uh, we have the original ERP system uh, by which you can manage your business operation efficiently from the procurement and stock and sales management. So we can provide this system with other car recycling company, which are our alliance company in Japan. So in this system, we have the big data about uh, uh, each material market price so that uh, we could use that uh, data for improving our profitability. Uh, for example, so when you purchase the end of life vehicle, you need to pay some fee to the car owner so that at the point you just input the car information into the system, you could get the focus of the sales price of the end of life vehicle itself. And also uh, you could get the recommended price for the purchasing uh, of end of life vehicle to make sure the profitability. So like this way, uh, we can uh, export this kind of a, a recycling packaging uh, solution system to the world. And now uh, we are looking for a partner which we can uh, share the vision and we can uh, uh, establish this business model in the, to the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's quite a global effort. Thank you, yeah, we are trying. Thank you so much. So from here, I would like to welcome back the judges and other winners to join the next panel, which is going to be the open feedback panel. So everybody can please feel free to join us again.
Great. Welcome back. So I would like to go ahead and kick off um, by passing the baton to the judges, Richard and David. Um, so what do you guys think? What is your feedback for these three really fantastic projects that we've brought back for today? You can give some comments. You can also ask some questions. If there's anything that you would like to clarify, of course, you're welcome to um, ask at this time. Great. Well, um, I mean, first, I want to congratulate all of the winners, um, you know, especially in this group here, but also all of the winners, you know, across the board in this um, uh, program. Um, and it really strikes me that, um, you know, the three winning projects we have here uh, are all doing something important, but all doing something slightly different. And I think that's exciting to to know that we have these great models and we need this great work on um, kind of new materials um, and biomaterials. We need this great work on um, reusing materials, um, you know, existing materials that are already there are also a resource. Um, and then, you know, not only that, but we can think about new ways of life, new jobs, in terms of auto recycling, in terms of manufacturing, new biomaterials for packaging, um, but new ways of life also in just an approach to the world and resources and society in a zero waste um, environment and, and town. And I think all of those are just so exciting. They really, um, to me, expand our minds about what, what circular economy could be, what circular approaches could be. It's not just um, simply, you know, one dimensional approach to sustainability. Great, thank you so much for your comment. Richard, would you like to add on? Yes, well, again, you know, some, some, it, it was a very hard job to go through the 200 and some uh, 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 submissions and there were some incredible ideas. So it was, uh, uh, a, a very a very daunting task i think to find a winner i think everybody that have submitted uh, ha has a winning has a winning project and and uh, no doubt that um, we we hope to, or at least i hope to see much more of uh, of this moving forward and materializing i think in the world we're really focusing a lot on mining and on fabricating all sorts of resources we have been really failing ourselves in finding systems in reutilizing better uh, and repurposing better uh, uh, within within our business. So, uh, reading through all the the submissions, I have felt a very uh, sort of reassuring sentiment that that there is hope for the future. That the resources that we are uh, having at our disposal will find a second life, and even maybe a third life and a fourth life moving forward. Um, so. Uh, but I think that, uh, and that was, in my opinion, uh, where I felt so strongly about Biopack is that it, it, it's to create a packaging from a material that was never considered as being um, a, a packaging material. You know, I am a big fan of seaweed as a chef. You know, I think it's one of the most incredible um, ingredients uh, and, and, and ingredients that are extremely rich in umami uh, and texture and color. Um, um, and of course, my love for Japan and the amount of time that I've spent in Japan, my love for seaweed has only grown. I was born and raised uh, uh, at, at the seaside village, and I was born and raised eating seaweed and seagrass and different plants that were growing wild on the shore. So for me to see uh, this uh, product to be given a very different purpose, uh, as much as there is a large variety of seaweeds, not all of them are absolutely delicious. Some of them are very difficult to eat and some are textural, very challenging. Uh, and to see that uh, we have found solutions for, for packaging through using seaweeds, uh, 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 also a an, 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 an plant that is so purposeful uh, in, in, our, in our world. Uh, very little people know about the the qualities of seaweeds, um, um, the, the way that it uh, that it draws CO two from the ocean, the way it's it's uh, sequestering ocean carbon, and, and how important actually seaweed is uh, seaweed is to our to our ecosystem, uh, I think is is not fully known, and um, I think that. Um, uh, you know, th this was for me the one that really stood out. But having said that, I think 
every single submission and every winner that is here on this panel uh, has been doing something incredible. I'm really uh, seduced by the project uh, of Eno, where you see where we are able to build a, vis a, a, a village where basically we live in a perfect ecosystem where you know there is absolutely no uh, waste being produced. Um, and I definitely put it high on my agenda to uh, to visit that village very soon when I when I'm able to travel again. Uh, I'm not a big fan of cars. I think they are wasteful and purposeful. But to find a solution for for uh, the recycling of cars seems to be really logical. Uh, and and um, my, my question maybe would be to Taishi is what part of a car is not recyclable? As I can imagine, there must be some of them that are very challenging, at least, to be recycled. Um, and I would love to hear about that, of course, you know, what what are and that maybe could create new circular economies. Maybe is there's a very smart pe person listening that will find a, a solution to to recycle those parts as well. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I have been very inspired by all these initiatives and uh, and I will follow them all very closely with uh, with keen interest. Thank you for your comment, Richard. Taishi, would you like to respond to his question about um, what part of the car might be difficult or perhaps right now thought to be impossible to recycle? Uh, thank you, Richard, for that question. Yeah, actually in Japan, it is very hard for recycle like uh, plastic and tire, rubber and glasses and car seat, uh, written. These are not uh, recyclable. I guess, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it is, they are going to the uh, incineration, but it's not materials recycle. Okay. Yeah, there is, a, you know, a, we can segregate material wise, but it, there is no technology for uh, material recycling. And also recycling cost is too much, so it doesn't pay in the mm. market. Yeah. I, I, I read a very interesting article, how about actually uh, tires were recycled in Africa and be used in af asphalt roads, which I thought was very, well, sort of really uh, make sense, you know, to give uh, the, the wheels that are that are uh, driving the roads to reuse them after their uh, circle of life into the roads itself really made sense to me. So um, maybe that that's that's where that there's there an opportunity in Japan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there, there is, uh, you know, some recycling technology like uh, you know, asphalt, but the market volume volume is you know small so mm -hmm. but the number of end of life tires are quite a lot mm -hmm. so there we need to find some you know market for the recycling i i want to jump in there and mention something that i heard you know just last week um at at the united nations climate conference um there at, at one of the many events there was um of Vice President of Sustainability from BMW. So it makes me think of you, Taishi. And um, he said something to the effect of um, how we need to rethink composite materials, you know, which we used to think even just a few years ago, maybe some people still think it today, like the composite materials would be the future. They're higher performance, they're lighter weight, things like carbon fiber and, you know, they certainly can be remarkable, but it's it was um, fascinating for me to hear, um, you know, one of the probably former champions of composite materials, like a car company like BMW, saying we need to rethink composite materials and refocus on mono materials in order to uh, allow for more circular approaches and more sustainability. Um, so, you know, hopefully, Taishi, Part of what you're doing, you know, can increase the awareness of the manufacturers themselves about the need for, um, you know, playing their role in, in this circular ecosystem. I mean, I, I also wanted to pick up on a couple of things that I wanted to say that um, for the auto recycling, I, I thought one of the most remarkable things about the, the project and the work you're doing is that you're combining circularity and reuse with meaningful labor and, and good jobs. And so it's not just about what's happening to the physical objects and materials, but it's about knowledge, creativity, um, 
you know, the value in having a good job. Um, and I thought there was something that it really um, reminded me of some early work in sustainability um, back in the 70s. And one of the pioneers of the, the whole re, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle mantra um, uh, was early in his career. This is a Swiss architect. He came up with this idea that um, the industry, he was looking at buildings, but the same could be said for, for cars, I think, um, that the industry could reduce its energy consumption and create good jobs at the same time. And the trick was through what he called prolonging the useful life. So by prolonging the useful life of buildings, you can both reduce their energy consumption, we could now also say their carbon footprint, and you can create good jobs. And I kept thinking of that in the work with auto recycling, that it's, it's, it's probably more, I'm sure there are challenges, but it's potentially more creative and more interesting work to be um, addressing a a used car has its own entity with its own character that's different than the next one, you know, as opposed to working on an assembly line and doing the same thing over and over again and optimizing your work there. And the idea that, that you could address those two things at once was just so exciting to me. I also wanted to mention that um, the idea of combining the local and the global, the expertise of a single company and of a kind of industry in Japan could connect to a waste ecosystem and a knowledge ecosystem in Africa, in other parts of the world, and that, that our approaches to circularity can be both like super local, but also global. And then that you can provide this model of global, you know, uh, globalization and global connection that's based on reuse and recycling rather than the models that we currently have for globalization, which are just based on profit and trade and extraction and consumption. Um, so I think you were touching on so, so many interesting things and those are some of the reasons I found your project so exciting. And then one last, so now I just wanna transition briefly and um, mention also how, um, excited I was to see the project now. Um, and speaking of going back to older approaches to sustainability, you know, I was really inspired by the idea, by, you know, many of the aspects of now, but including the idea that um, there are circular practices and sustainable practices, you know, dating back hundreds or thousands probably of years. And that there is, you know, to, to quote the project, you know, the lost wisdom of the past. Um, and that we could try to uncover that again and emulate that and, and in a way make it our own. That you're, the project is inviting people to make it their own, to, to see it, experience it, and then make it their own. And, and really, I thought that it was, it was, amazing to see this project that was both quiet and radical um, and that had a vision for, you know, not only sustainability and responsibility, but a vision for a good life. And, you know, that circularity is about a way of life as much as about a technical approach to, you know, energy and, and materials. Um, and, that, and that we really need to change our way of life um, to address the immensity of the problems and that it can be wonderful and appealing, not just a sense of sacrifice. Um, so I, I thought it was, it was just so exciting to see this project being so kind of generous about a, an approach and uh, a wisdom and inviting people in, in a way that hopefully can have this multiplier effect when, when people leave that experience and go back into all kinds of different homes around the world. Thank um, you. So I, I also really um, was inspired by this project. 
I, I mean, just one thing for from Kamikatsu, I think that in the media, it's portrayed as this perfect One of the things that we will is that this is, um, we don't want people to think that this is something we do and so then it's not possible for someone else. Um, essentially with kamikatsu as well, we use the word zero waste, but this is a misnomer because zero, like gomi zero in Japanese kind of means no garbage. And so the idea of this was that we would pre um, prevent garbage from going into the landfill. But this doesn't actually stop us from producing waste because everything that everyone purchases in the village is still essentially from the production line, you know, of the larger society. And so one of the things that we've really learned is how recycling works um, in Kamikatsu. And as Taishi said, one of the things that we cannot recycle is rubber. We cannot recycle um, a lot of different types of plastic. And even though they're in a category, they're still incinerated, um, sometimes for energy, sometimes melted clean plastic. We actually melt into a plastic glue that we use for car parts um, to glue car parts together. And so looking at one of the problems was that in Kamikatsu, they had a declaration that by 2020, they would create zero waste. And so right now, Kamikatsu's recycling rate is at 80%. And we were not able to get to that extra 20% because there are so many materials that are just made to be one-time use. And so the impetus, um, well, the onus is on the producers to start looking at you know, how they're creating their products, which is designed basically to be thrown away. And I actually just wanted to say um, about the point you made earlier, David, because when we were looking at recycling, I was looking at this idea of planned obsolescence, which was started with the car industry, where you know before things were made to be fixed. So you would have your um, refrigerators, you would have your dishwashers, and if those got broken, then you would hire a repairman to fix it. And so that created you know this um, whole industry of skill that was needed for repair. But then when the car, um, well, Ford started understanding that if they could create a car that they changed every season, then they have one customer that they can use repeatedly instead of, you know, having one customer for life and they lose that uh, profitability. And so by creating this idea of, you know, that was essentially kind of how the linear economy started. And so it takes away from that creativity of how do we create something and repair? And every time we repair it, we're actually creating something different as well. And instead, now we just have this item that is cheaply made because we know that, you know, there is something called a garbage can, which is where all of these things will go afterwards. And so we don't have to worry about the end of life. We only worry about the start of life. And so with, you know, the recycling system in Kamikatsu, trying to really think about, well, where is that end of life? And having a program like Taishi, you know, especially knowing in Japan, there are so many used cars, um, people are cannot recycle. Well, we have to pay for something called shakin here, which is an insurance. And so that becomes very expensive. And when that um, is no longer feasible, then the idea is just to buy a new car. And so all of these old cars are, you know, um, being put away with without having a, a place to go and so now knowing that there is a company who is doing that is um, very inspiring so thank you Taishi, for all that your company is doing as well where i think that that it is interesting i mean i mean the journey we went through within in hotel operations we we are we are animals of convenience in our industry mm -hmm. you know we when we started to eliminate um single-use plastic we we identify a lot of uh things that we were using on a daily basis that contain PLA, uh, such as wipes, uh, sponges, uh, cling film, vacuum bags, and so forth. So, so what we saw on the journey to eliminate single-use plastic is that we, we basically went back and travel in time. We basically went back, how did our grandfathers and grandmothers mm -hmm. deal with these kind of project problems? Mm -hmm. and, and that is where the wisdom probably is. Uh, the, the interesting part in finding solutions to this is you will start up partnerships with companies that are really struggling. And all of a sudden you find a solution, for example, for an element such as a sponge, uh, where, where you go back and find old, uh, old type of sponges that are 100% plant-based that are the solution for your operation. Of course, we, we work in an environment where we want everything to be safe and, and to the highest possible hygienic standards. So you will need to find systems and procedures and build them into place to make sure that you're not making uh, people ill or cross-contaminate certain areas with dirty sponges. But, but, but um, what I'm trying to say is that in the journey, we have 
built some really strong uh, small companies in providing solutions to, uh, to, to what we have. But very often these were uh, com companies that were out of business for a very long time because they were conceived, uh, conceived as old fashioned, old school, uh, and not anymore sort of fit for this sort of time and era. So, so I, what I'm uh, saying is that basically we have been able to create these circular economy around us of small companies that were struggling and all of a sudden are thriving again because uh, what we did uh, 50 years ago was actually the right thing to do. Just about sponges, we actually have a plant-based, it is a plant, it's a gourd basically, and then mm -hmm. you dry it out and you cut it. And that's what people used to use to wash their bodies, to wash mm -hmm. their dishes. And now we use that in coming as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we use a different type of sponge, but it's biodegradable. It goes into the anaerobic digester, it disappears, and it's, and it's a very uh, passionate sort of subject because the amount of sponges I have used over my career or my teams have used over my career that are synthetic is, is incredible. And they're all in some shape or form still on this planet. So, so that is, of course, the, the, the worrying part. And we would use uh, sponges for one service and threw them away because we, we didn't want to deal with cross-contamination and the, the dangers of, of bacterial growth. Um, but, but um, yeah, so now we just boil them up and we dry them. And then the next day we use them again. You know, it's very old school uh, uh, disinfecting, but it seems to work. Great. So, um, sorry to interrupt your very fruitful conversation, but I would like to now bring in Tim Wong for the next section of the crosstalk. I think that we can continue with this line of um, this line of thinking and line of questioning as well. Tim, are you here with us today? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, I almost yeah, I almost don't want to interrupt because it's already very smoothly transitioned to the crosstalk already. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So basically, with the crosstalk topic for today is about a multidisciplinary approach to the circular economy. Um, I think that perhaps some of the winners have been uh, working in their field for a great deal of time, um, perhaps as a researcher, perhaps as a business person, perhaps as an informed citizen. Um, at the same time, I think that something interesting about the players in the room is that, you know, we're all thinking about these issues for our own uh, industry, our own work but also because we care deeply on a more broad, um, in a more broad perspective. And so with that, I would like to ask Tim to, um, yes, continue with the line of questioning, um, in particular, uh, you know, bringing in, how do I say it, like a multi-layer conversation about um, what I think ties these projects together, which is how do you deal with the waste once it's there? So for example, in the case of um, Nori with Biopack, um, from the beginning of the design of, of the seaweed-based um, single-use uh, packaging material, that's the kind of like at the forefront of the design of this. Um, so with that, yes, I would like to bring Tim into continuing the, continue the questioning. Yes. So, so I, I do want to like smoothly go back to the conversation that you guys are in. And um, in the context of what we were just tapping into right now is that, first of all, I, I, re I really enjoy the, the kind of wide spectrum of the work every all the speakers are doing today. And then this is, I think, really, really a great opportunity to kind of share and also uh, maybe having a, a more real conversations uh, about like, because I think all of you guys already proved that 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 you guys are the pioneers in your own industries and your own field practices, um, and then you are really willing to go that extra mile, not just for your own benefits, but actually has, seeing the bigger picture of how we should live uh, as a society, not just for our generation, but for for the next generation. And on that note, I think one of the key points that you guys are already touching on is that there's a paradigm shift and a, and a change of mentality that you're trying to convince a larger group of public is that like previously our linear types of economy, maybe is, there is a beginning and an end, but what you guys are doing actually is really trying to convince how to reconnect the ending with the beginnings. And that, that just like the, the, the example of the sponges is, is perfect because in that case, even as simple as the sponge that you just mentioned, right? Uh, but if we were to think about that as a circular, something that we can adapt, not just with technology, but like, like lost wisdoms 
from the past. Uh, uh, that that would be great. And 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 the other thing is actually um, and and David and also Taishi mentioned about like when we talk about uh, uh circular and and and, and we, we're not only just talking about the environment and the ecology, but also the human factors of it. How to make the society in some senses more fair. I, I think you guys are tackling all these um issues. Uh, from multiple perspective, and then we kind of have to, we, we we're trying to attack for this from all fronts in order to make it work. Yeah, it's almost like if we're diffusing a bomb, it needs to be pressed on both ends in order to defuse it, <laughs> rather than just pressing on one one buttons. So 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 on that note, actually, the real topic I want to bring in is actually what is your current challenge? Like, what is the current bottlenecks that you guys are facing individually? Like, who are the person that you want to push the button together, right, in order to make this work? So, so just, I want to open the floor to just, like, have minimum disruption to what you guys were already talking about. So, Go for ahead. me, yeah. uh, the challenge is um, to decrease the cost. Um, because uh, seaweed-based biopackaging doesn't change uh, a lot about the consumer behavior. I mean, we do not uh, sacrifice the convenience and the time of our consumers. If we compare our product with like reusable packaging, for example, the glass jar, uh, it sacrifices a bit about convenience. People have to uh, keep in mind if they want to go sh for shopping, they have to bring the empty glass jar and so on, so on. So it's not practical, it's not convenient, but our product is convenient. But uh, the challenge is uh, the cost. So now we are striving to uh, cut the cost without sacrificing the seaweed farmers. So what we do is uh, increase our production efficiency, increase the efficiency in seaweed cultivation, in seaweed transportation, and also in our manufacturing process and in the product distribution. Hopefully later we can provide our product uh, more competitive especially when it is ordered in big amount. So now we are also uh, screening the potential distributors in all countries. And uh, we hope later uh, in every country, we will have at least one distributor so we can send the product in bulk. It is a uh, very uh, efficient in terms of uh, transportation cost. We actually tried to order from your company because um, we also run a zero waste cafe. And that was the problem that we ran into because we, we are a small operation. So by ordering a small amount, the cost was just not effective. And I think, but that is also um, a consumer problem, which is that we are so used to things costing so cheap that we don't actually know what the real value of things are. So when you have something in a market that is sustainable or organic or you know well-sourced, um, that usually has a higher price tag. And so consumer doesn't understand that. They see that, they only see the higher price tag rather than the story behind, you know, why that should cost that much. Um, and in terms of, you know, what we're looking at right now is that even if we're trying to change one person's mindset about what zero waste is, you know, using not one-time use items and bringing their own products, when they're living in a society and a system that is completely turned against that. So even if you are wanting to bring your own water bottle, but if one day you forget it, you know, there are so many stores all around you that are selling one-time use water um, in plastic bottles. It's very difficult to use that mindset every time to say, well, I wanna be sustainable when convenience usually is the thing that is gonna trump that in most of the cases. And so I think for us, the biggest problem, I mean, not just us, I think just as, society in general is that we're living in a system that is staggered against the individual and system changes aren't happening because the companies are not asked to stop producing you know one-time use products and then the onus is on the individual to be a better person and so we create this idea that if you're not being sustainable you're you're the one who is the problem rather than the system itself and then so by creating these different products and creating this conversation where we're starting to educate the consumer to understand where, you know, and become curious about where their products come from, then we can slowly start to change. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is that the change will come too slowly if it's not coming from a policy perspective, because, you know, I, again, we're, we don't have any kind of 
um, push, right? You have uh, ideas coming in about what is climate change, you know, all the different dangers of it, but then there is no actual consequence if you do not act upon it. Um, and we're seeing that from a governmental perspective, right? The governments themselves from COP26 did not try to make any push towards actually creating legislator that will stop um, fossil fuels. So from the top down, there's not that kind of a um, em emergency. And so then in that, I mean, I don't have any answers to this question. It just becomes what, what should we do in, in that sense where the system is not actually changing? Yeah, I want to pick up on that because I think the idea that, um, uh, well, just the ideas of policy and government. Um, so in, in other words, that, you know, the bottleneck, in one sense is cost and and Nora, your, your innovations are so exciting and I'm sure you are gonna be, continue to be so innovative and bring down the cost. But at the same time, we want government standards, regulation and incentives to help um, price things properly. You know, so, you know, for example, if there was a tax or a penalty for waste, a tax or a penalty for carbon emissions, then immediately, Nora, your product would probably be the least expensive. Um, and it just shows us that our systems are already designed. I mean, it's not like our systems are neutral now. They're designed against circularity in some cases. Uh, um, and uh, just one quick thing. Um, I was actually pretty surprised to hear, um, I mean, we hear it in the news and I was hearing it, you know, at, at COP26 that all kinds of businesses are asking the government to create standards, to have regulation. They want that. Um, even if the companies are just still basically trying to make a profit, they understand that their long-term survival requires them to be more circular, requires them to be more sustainable. Um, and they want more certainty about what's going to happen. And so they, they're almost begging the <laughs> governments to actually be more proactive in the ways you're describing, you know, Linda and Nori and Richard, you're describing aspects of this too. And so I, I, think, I think that is one model forward to get rid of the bottlenecks. And then Tim, if we have time later, I also think thinking about this kind of systems thinking that people are bringing up, including what you're working on, Richard, and um, connecting different industries and having, you know, so not only dealing with um, materials, but also dealing with food and also dealing with waste and also dealing with energy. And I think that can be a really exciting multiplier effect to a lot of the work that everyone's doing individually and to the great thing that the Circular Awards are doing, which is bringing everyone together. Like this community could have this um, you know, multiplier effect. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think one of the things that I, I think the because you already are trying to use the kind of data on the hot infrastructure, meaning that the 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 wider spectrum of how a building is performing, but almost in that sense, I I was just thinking as just just a, a brainstorming during this conversation is actually this time because the I think previously I think the the kind of convenience of single use plastic. Actually, the the consequence there is cost. It's just that that cost is ignored, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah. so in that case, and 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 most people actually, even us, like we we're unaware of that cost. Mm -hmm. So, in some sense, if if we can actually bring that cost back up to our consciousness, in that case, like what you were saying, that actually what Nori is doing is maybe even in the long run within a, within a fixed period, actually you can see the return. Actually, in that case, the, the benefits. It's way higher, and we 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 trust that, but we didn't we just couldn't quantify it at this point, right? So so I think in some sense I, I think we well, of course we we're trying to convince the the kind of conventional economy of okay this is cheaper this but at the same time maybe there's another way to actually in, like to visualize or like to bring in the consciousness of actually what was the like what is the current linear model is actually what is that real cost because it's just that that cost wasn't actually um, accountable mm -hmm. I, I to think that, the actual users, yeah. 
That point about the actual cost, I think, is exceptionally interesting. Um, mm. Perhaps the first actual cost that comes to <clears> mind <throat> is the cost of dealing with the waste, mm. which is resulting from the product. But for example, yeah. if you think about the research and production that went into creating that product or building or ingredient or material from the beginning, that is also being wasted. So for example, to think about it in context of um, a building, for instance, there was energy and money and resources and work that went into building that building. And so whenever it becomes destroyed and a new one is replaced in its stead, it's not just the cost of the new materials to create the new building or the future costs of the materials, which will eventually um, become waste, but the original cost um, from the original building, or in the case of a package, for example, the original cost that went into that package. Um, so I, yeah, I think that this kind of uh, thought of phasal real cost is also very insightful. Um, and I hope to see some visualizations in the future of this actual cost. Uh, in other industries. One of the things we like to do is teach all our guests um, farming because we think that if you're going to eat food, you should see where your food comes from. And really just coming from my own experience, right, of going through the cycle of planting rice, um, you'll never leave any grain of rice uh, in your bowl again because most people who eat food only know their food comes from a package in a grocery store. And so whenever it's not anything Thing that they've ever experienced of not having, you know, it's always right there. And so when you actually plant the food and you see how much effort goes into it, any kind of waste is no longer acceptable. Um, and also in terms of cost as well, I think as Tim's point, you know, nobody um, in the modern world, in uh, Western society, it really understands where their garbage goes. And so that's never been something that's taught to us. That's not something that we're even curious about because it's something hidden. You know, all we know is that there's a garbage can. When we're done with something, we throw it in the garbage can and then we put it on the curb, you know, once a week and then it's gone out of our minds. And so because we don't have that connection to the beginning of when we use it to the end, you know, there's no need for us to even think about, like when we see plastic coming into the ocean, that's the first time we're like, oh, you know, this actually has to go somewhere. It doesn't just disappear into this black hole. Um, by having the 45 different categories of, of, of recycling here in Kamikatsu, the, the biggest change that has really happened is really just seeing whatever we're using as a material. Because at the end, we have to separate everything out. So let's say you buy an electric blanket and you want to get rid of it, you can get rid of it for free at the garbage center, but then the staff there and also the person who's throwing it out will have to rip that blanket apart, pull all the electrical wires to separate. Here is the plastic, this is the metal, and everything has to get um, recycled individually. And so you start to actually see the composite rather than just the one item that you call garbage because you don't need it anymore. And then that starts to get people to understand that everything we use is actually just a material right? That the end of the life of this item is not garbage. The end of the life of this material is the same material that it was when it started. It's just the way that you perceive it now when you don't need it is you call it garbage. Same thing is if you have food that you don't want to eat anymore because you're full, you can throw it away as garbage. But then two hours later, when you're hungry again, you know, that slice of pizza is now looking great. But if you had thought of it as garbage and you threw it away, it's no longer something you have instead of something called leftovers, which is now something, you know, that is wonderful because you're hungry again. Yeah, so so I think, so this is actually uh, because uh, I think one of the key things about the, um, what we do in trying to do the circular award, I think there, there are a few things that we aim to do. I, I, first of all, obviously, one thing is to really raise the awareness of what everybody's doing around the world. And, 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 and we all, a lot of these things are, are at the very beginning of, of this effort or this initiatives. So the first thing that we're trying to do is, is to raise the awareness of all the great things that everybody's doing around the world. But also the second thing is really, we, we, we don't want, we don't, we, we want this to be a more sustainable community in a way that we can try to help each other out. And, and, and so, so for my second, and actually, because at the time I, I wanted to combine the second and third question is, is actually, um, we, we touched on this already, uh, is that with this wide spectrum, and we understand that in order to look at these problems, 
holistically. And then this already, what we are doing right now is naturally crossing a lot of the conventional practices or silos of industries already. So I, I'm, I'm just curious in terms of like the, the, the types of things that like for what you are doing next, um, <clears throat> what, 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 which industry or what are uh, which what 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 expertise or maybe seemingly unrelated uh, 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 skills that you would need or you would like <clears throat> in your in what you are doing right now? Okay, uh, so right now uh, we are screening the distributors from all countries, and also we have increased uh, the interest from Japanese also. So hopefully our product can be uh, distributed to Japan. And uh, yeah, I do agree. Uh, if I go back to the uh, previous conversation, I do agree that uh, government should take a strategic role in uh, solving the problem. It's not only uh, the responsibility of the private sector, not only the responsibility of uh, our uh, of all of us who are concerned about sustainability, but it is the responsibility for all stakeholders. So I think, for example, if I uh, take one example of uh, Indonesia government, president uh, has known about this, but uh, the policy uh, has not been distributed to the uh, regional government. So, uh, for example, when they charge um, the plastic bag, the shopping bag for consumers, they only just uh, 0.01 cent of the uh, shopping bag. If we compare with, uh, for example, the parking cost, the parking uh, fee is uh, 14 cents. So uh, we can imagine that uh, it is still considered as free. That's why uh, we cannot solve the uh, plastic waste. Yeah. So what uh, we will do is uh, decreasing the cost. And also when I won some awards, um, I use the awards to uh, give uh, the support to our customers, uh, to support the shipping cost or to, uh, to give the discount for the products. So we can uh, increase since we launched our biopack brand in March 2020, we have increased our sales exponentially. No, Nori, if I if I can have a question, I mean this is wonderful to hear. But did you ever consider to license the technique uh, to be able to produce it in other parts of the world? Is that something that you would consider? I can imagine that there are many countries that have the cap capability of growing seaweed and could apply your knowledge and technology into uh, making this and maybe bring down significant the cost of shipping uh, and so forth. And also, of course, reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, yes, I think a license is a uh, very strategic, maybe uh, in the future, like uh, maybe in three years or five years, uh, because I know also like Tanzania also is a, a big seaweed producer, so we can license the product there. Or uh, once we can produce a cutlery, now the prototype has been has finished, but uh, we have not launched yet. Mm -hmm. um, when we uh, produce uh, the cutlery, uh, it is a lot of uh, void volume, so it causes the inefficiency in distribution cost. So we want to license. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on on a, on a positive note, Hong Kong uh, is uh, is pushing for new legislation where all takeaway packaging needs to be home compostable, uh, starting very soon. So that mm -hmm. means there's definitely significant market market to to take by your company within Hong Kong itself. You know, Hong Kong is the capital of takeaway food in the world. Um, um, People do not cook a lot at home, and uh, particularly during the pandemic, the, the amount of takeaway has significantly grown. So, so of course, uh, to see this legislation being pushed is a is a is a is a very positive development in Hong Kong. And we have actually seen through that that, of course, the demand on 
biodeg home biodegradable packaging has grown significantly. And along with that, we have seen prices drop by up to 100%. So, uh, you know, where we see where volume comes into play, also we see that there is efficiencies um, in, in terms of pricing and so forth. So um, uh, I think a very positive development, and I hope, of course, other countries will develop very similar uh, policies within, within the years to come, and that would open significant you know, markets to, to be taken for you. Well, hopefully I can find partners in Hong Kong and uh, talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay in touch. Uh, I think okay. it's, uh, it's really important, Richard, uh, to bring up those positive examples. So thank you for that, because that's part of this whole idea, I guess, you know, that we need the kind of community of sharing these positive examples and having them spread. Um, really quickly, I want to just, just mention one thing I'm learning from you, Nori, is, um, is about um, a new kind of organic or grown material. So I've been thinking a lot about grown materials. And one um, interesting aspect for me of, of biomaterials or grown materials for, for architecture has been that they it starts to engage with land use, with things like forestry and agriculture and food because you know if we are now going to get our architectural materials from forests in terms of wood or you know from agricultural waste um, then all of a sudden we're kind of doing this cross-disciplinary thing that you're describing Tim and, and, and Kelsey and I think it's just really interesting it, it, it kind of invites the kind of system thinking and collaboration because all of a sudden you know, an architect and an architectural material supplier has to talk to the person who's an expert in forestry to find the right, you know, balance of things. And then you're also talking about the potential use of land for food and what's the right balance there. Mm -hmm. Nora, yours is interesting because you're, it's possible to grow materials not on land, but on water. That's a, a, an incredible idea. But the one last, on the, on the topic of positive examples, one thing I've been fascinated by recently is what's called agrivoltaics. And it's basically the idea that you can combine large scale photovoltaic arrays, this kind of utility scale um, renewable energy with agriculture growing food. Um, and so you have agriculture, energy production and water all in this weird kind of synergy it's not totally you know natural yeah. but the shade of the photovoltaics actually helps produce new and better kinds of vegetables and it's actually really good for areas of drought because it allows for use of a soil that wouldn't be possible without that shade so these strange hybrids that are that are possible I think could could be a really exciting direction and another positive example for how circular approaches can really help cross industries and 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 have these positive feedback loops. Yes, exactly. I hope uh, leather seaweed can be the default for uh, packaging materials and also for for example for building materials. So we do not uh, depend uh, too much on the forest on the land because the land is very limited, but uh we still have a very huge potency in our seashore and uh there are more than 600 species of seaweed with different characteristics so we can use it for um making the products with different characteristics also so hopefully in the future we can have seaweed as our default packaging materials and also as uh, not only for packaging, for single-use packaging, but I think it can uh, answer really the problem about uh, from plastic waste pollution. I just wanted to show you, actually, Richard. This is the um, sponge. Oh, yes. It's loofah. So it's a gourd, and then you yeah. just cut it, and then you use it as a sponge, and afterwards you just compost. Yeah. Yes. I well, use it to, to, to cleaning the tank. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's like it's we, we, we use this sponge actually as one of our guest, guest amenity. It's a little bit more sophisticated. We don't give them a whole court, of course. Uh, <laughs> but but we, we, use, we use the loofah in our, in our bathrooms. So uh, Because also within the hotel, 
uh, all the packaging and all the guest amenities uh, have to be 100% single-use plastic-free. And, mm -hmm. and if, I may, if I may show something as well, and then Nora would be very happy. <laughs> we, have, we have your products already two years here, so just that you know. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, you buy it from my marketing company, Ifover. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I read about your company two and a half years ago, and and mm -hmm. I ordered it immediately. And we 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 use your products. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. This is great. I I, I don't know how much time we we, we have more, but I I mean the. Yeah, I, I think there, there, there's a few things. I, I'm sure like like Linda, I think like one thing I, I do want to bring up, um, I, I'm sure that because the pandemic obviously uh, kind of ha have an impact on what you're doing as well. So, mm -hmm. but just to to kind of throw an idea out because we, we before the pandemic, we also did a, um, uh, a, a kind of a, we did a project in Hida, uh, Fukawa, and, and, and we were, we were trying to so so there are some programs that we work with University of Toronto uh, Parsons and other universities uh, to bring students into the communities to actually work with them. So in a way that when we're thinking about urban design, so it's not just about from from a from building perspective, but also working with the community in that sense. I I, I was just thinking like these types of things would be. Uh, uh, interesting in a way that to kickstart and also some of these awareness, especially you coming from Canada in that case. And also one of the things is actually when we de dealing with the kind of global and local communities, though, so it doesn't have to be just like like Toronto with Tokyo, but also mm -hmm. so they can also directly go into these types of small communities. And in some sense, there are innovations that we can start to be able to to think about like kind of reconnecting these types of um, traditional wisdoms with maybe new technologies or new design thinkings in that perspective and do some experiment prototyping within the very local communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly I think that might mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to connect with the community. So what we want to build is um, a community space in Kamikatsu so that people who are looking for these, you know, thinking about sustainability as uh, we want to create that connection in a space where people can come and learn and then also connect with each other. And we're actually trying to start a camp in March um, and also working with different universities. As you mentioned, because we, we actually opened our business during the pandemic, so we've never had any inbound customers um, mm -hmm. because the borders of Japan have been closed. And so yeah. we, as soon as you know this is possible for travel, we really want to start getting more and more people connected. And then with the hands-on personal experience, which is you know much more impactful, than something mm -hmm. where you're only reading about it or learning about it through something yeah. you know, like a publication. Yeah, yeah. I think also one thing I want to talk with David uh, as well, I think it would be really interesting to think about like the kind of model that you built, like the kind of analytical model that you built, not just about building construction. Like now that the model is already go beyond just the construction phase, but going into like the operational phase, but also like if we were to put, be able to push beyond the operational phase, meaning like the, the occupancy, like the usage by the occupancy, that will also be very interesting. And then in that case, then we can really see the performance, not just from building perspective, but actually from a user perspective in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and you know, I think in terms of circularity, um, data, and like you were also saying, Kelsey, visualization, I think is, is gonna be so important as we're scaling up all of the best approaches, um, understanding the data you know, at the right resolution. You know, mm. Does it make sense to ship certain things to other places if they can be transformed there? But what's the data of you know, the carbon emitted for the shipping? Um, right. As we're reusing things, what is the, you, you know, the data that we have to work with as we're occupying buildings and deciding right, right, right. whether to transform them or not? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think also there's this incredible concept related to data about material passports. If you can give a unique identity to a building element, but it could also, Taishi, be a tire in a car, not just 
a general tire. It's a specific tire that's been on the road mm. for this amount of time that has these cracks in it. Um, same with a, a beam in a building or a brick. If you give a material an identity, then it's easier to change the mindset in terms of reusing it and tracking it. And that's going to require some data approaches. So I think, again, there's this hybrid potential of like returning to the wisdom of older people and cultures on the one hand and traditional practices. And at the same time, having strategies to use some technology to think through <clears throat> challenges of scaling up and knowing how to make the best decisions in a data informed way. That's great. Thank you. So I, I don't know, I don't want to overrun <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> meeting for too long, but Kelsey, how are we doing with time? Um, so I could continue this conversation for the rest of the day, but unfortunately we are out of time for this cross talk. Um, the beautiful thing is that we don't have to finish here. Of course, we're connected um, online and sometimes in person as well. So I would like to, you know, very much so encourage the relationships being built today among the winners and judges um, to continue in a, a sustainable and, and healthy manner. And also, you know, we, I also want to invite the people who are listening at home to, you know, engage with us and ask us questions. Um, you know, is there any kind of feedback from people who might be listening at home or at work or in third spaces um, about the presentations being made today? Um, something that I am particularly uh, appreciated about the forum that we had today was, um, and of course we've covered so much, <laughs> but about um, people and their labor, people and their work. I think that whenever we're thinking about, um, you know, people at being activated in kamikatsu to experience, um, you know, an in-depth, in-person, um, circular lifestyle, or whenever we think about the people in Indonesia who are working hard to harvest seaweed for an endeavor, which maybe they have, uh, you know, sincere sympathy for towards, but perhaps they're just doing their job and they're, they're doing the work that, that they, they want to do. Um, and then I think about the people around the world who are working for Kaiho Industries who are, you know, dealing with the results of people around the world using fossil fuel um, automobiles and providing value in their community from this from an economic perspective. Um, you know, I think that this uh, common thread between all of these projects is very uh, interesting and something that um, I hope is also inspiring to the people in the audiences. Um, and yeah, something that you know, it was mentioned previously by Richard, but, you know, gives me some hope for the future as well um, as people who are existing and working and, uh, you know, being productive and also consuming in this society. So anyways, with, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and begin to close uh, the ceremonies for today. So here we go. Great. So as I mentioned previously, um, we do warmly welcome people to give us their comments, ask questions. Um, if you have anything that you'd like clarified about today's uh, summit activities, we would really love to hear from you all. Um, so please feel free to scan the code and uh, fill out the survey provided here. Um, next up is going to be our second panel for the Circular Summit. Uh, the title for this panel is Materials for a Circular Economy. A, cir a circular economy for materials. Um, this is going to be hosted from Kyoto. Uh, we will be joined by moderator Junya Ida, who is a creative director at Loftwork Kyoto. We will also be joined by two judges, uh, Anna Laura Cantera, who is a bioelectronic artist, researcher, and professor at Yuntref University. We will also be joined by Anita DeWitt, who is the founder of Reblend. So I look forward very much to. Uh, that panel. And with this, I would like to draw to a close our uh, panel today. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. It was my great pleasure to hear from you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Good luck to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.